guest this hour is, back for his third time, James Roger Brown. We're going to talk this hour about some eclectic material. Are you there, Roger? Can you hear me all right? Yes, I am, and yes, I can. Well, that sums that up very nicely. Glad to have you back again. For our listeners who missed the first two programs, you can hear them in the archives, of course. What are we going to talk about tonight, Roger? Well, I uh, need to lay some foundation for the foundation. All right. But uh, I want to talk about uh, methodology and implications of um, interspecies intelligence collection methodology I developed. For those of your listeners who may not have heard of him, I highly recommend they listen to William Pollock's disclosure video. His last name is P-A-W-E-L-E-C. Yeah, uh, well-known uh, name uh, among people who are interested in the unusual, and he is certainly well-versed in that. Well, if you've seen his video, you know that he had uh, his own set of weird uh horrific experiences. He and I worked on trying to build the technology to do what I'm going to describe uh, unsuccessfully. We quite literally do not have the technology to build it, nor the memory storage capacity to use the scanning technology if we did. Um, He told me that when he finally understood what I'm about to impart, mm-hmm. it scared the crap out of him. Well. So if any of your listeners have a similar experience, they're probably in good company. Mm-hmm. Um, first, I need to state some facts about how your central nervous system actually works. You um, build uh, neural structures as you grow to process sensory input. And uh, one artifact of that is that your um, what you have direct access to ends at your skin surface. Anything beyond that, mm-hmm. your central nervous system constructs reality simulations. And your survivability depends on the goodness of fit between the reality simulation and objective reality. And there is an objective reality out there. Some of the limiting factors that cause problems are that we only have narrow band sensory systems Mm -hmm. and do not get all of the information, all of the input possible from energy events outside our bodies. Really? What's the percent that we actually are able to avail well, ourselves Well, it, it of? depends on, on the type of phenomena. I understand. Yeah, you know, um, a solar, say you're uh, looking at sunlight, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we can only see a, a narrow band of that, but we know that it also produces x-rays um, and, and other bands of, of um, energy that we have no no way of processing. Okay. Uh, you write um, programs. I call them biological programs. And if you want to get some foundation in those, I recommend John C. Lilly's book, Programming and Metaprogramming in the Human Biocomputer. He identified the, the rules by which programs are constructed. Lily also, is a very bright man. That's uh, another interesting name to drop. Yes. Yeah. He um, also did a critical set of experiments on sensory deprivation and devised ways to cut down what we call the five senses sensory input to negligible to zero. And what happened rather than the brain dying as uh, was predicted by current psychology understanding at the time, the brain continued to apparently process sensory input. Um, 
Dr. Lilly concluded that the brain was actually simulating sensory input, but in fact, it was processing sensory input in bandwidths we don't have names for. Really? Yes. That's, um, a, that's a stunner. Uh, uh, we actually have, depending on what you would accept as a sense, mm-hmm. uh, 10 to 12 senses. To learn how to use most of those, you'd have to go uh, to a Buddhist monastery or mm-hmm. take up a martial art to learn learn the skills. To uh, you know, you have to build sensory, uh, build neural structures to process sensory input, regardless of what band it is or what you're going to do with it. You now actually you, you, have you... to learn how to do it. Okay. Okay. All right. I understand. Did you work with Lily also? Did you? Say no, that? I did not. Okay. Um, but he was one of the key people when I was um, looking for a solution to three problems that I took on after um, completing my master's thesis on World War II intelligence operations. And as part of that, I interviewed a number of World War II era intelligence professionals from various services to get some idea of how to structure it. Uh Uh, One of the things that you need to know about the sociology of people in the intelligence community, if you ask a favor of them uh, and it involves information they've personally developed or is derived from their personal experiences, they will ask you for some kind of favor. You can tell what kind of person you're dealing with by what they ask you for. How interesting. The um, three people that I um, interviewed during that time, one of them was an officer on General Eisenhower's personal security staff. Mm -hmm. And... He told me two pieces of E.T. information from World War II. One was that uh, they discovered some uh, technology that was distorting the Earth's magnetic field because it was throwing off bombing raids targeting by the same number of degrees on a, on each of the trips. Three degrees or something like that, something small, but it was precise each time. Yes, yes. Uh, and in fact, I think it was three degrees. Huh, uh-huh. Um, anyway, uh, I suspect that they were not able to get access to the whatever it was they found in the vicinity of where the, um, elect, the magnetic pole was at the time because I, I suspect that whoever put it there would have uh, installed some security measures to keep out polar bears and curious sure. monkeys that showed up. Monkeys like us, yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, uh, he also told me that they were aware of three to five fly- flights a month of UFOs entering the North Pole and flying down the middle of the Pacific to the South Pole. Uh-huh. They suspected that they were supply runs. He specifically asked me to find out everything I could about the ETs and what they were doing. And this is a man on General Eisenhower's staff. Yes. He was on this staff during World War II. Uh-huh. I, I talked to him after World War II. This was um, during the um, 70s. Uh-huh. when I interviewed these people. So it was well after World War II. Mm-hmm. Um, two of the other individuals were most concerned with the lack of objective foundation for the intelligence system, and they asked me to find a way to address that deficiency. Basically, they understood and knew from their own personal experiences that the intelligence system was uh, run on political processes. There was no objective 
unit of analysis, huh. uh, no true objective methodology, and they they knew that it was going to be corrupt, as we now know uh, oh, is exactly it, what happened. Is, is it ever? And how many different types? Well, there are intelligence services out there with advanced technology at their disposal that we don't even know the names of. This is spreading all over the place. P- private corporations, I bet in some cases multinationals have their own. Uh, yes. It's, it's nutty. Well, all of that technology is geared toward control of the population. Sure. Uh, benefiting the elite, and uh, some things that are that are truly bizarre. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I pointed out was that the uh, goodness of fit between the reality simulation that you're dealing with and external reality. Um, you know, has it, you you look at one of the things from World War II. You would expect that we would need to have an accurate reality simulation of the past. Huh. But one of the classified documents I found out about from the, these people was a classified archaeological study done by the Office of Naval Intelligence in the late 40s to early 50s. And it was supposed, things back then were supposed to be declassified after 30 years. Well, that study is de- still classified, and I've found any number of people who've read it, uh, even as recently as the Vietnam uh, War era, uh-huh. and um, someone in uh, Korea had read it. Mm-hmm. But it, it's nowhere to be found. It should be in the National Intelli- National Archives. Uh, they've never heard of it, and uh, I've not been able to find anybody who could remember the exact title for me to do more specific searching. Um, if anyone's listening that, that knows that, I would appreciate finding out what it is. How would they contact you, uh, James? Um, my email address is real hard to remember. The sociologist at roadrunner.com. That's a tough one. (laughs) S-O-C. I couldn't believe that nobody had had that. Yeah, Um, that's funny. The sociologist at roadrunner.com. All right, if you can't remember that, you probably shouldn't be emailing. All right. (laughs) Yes. Um, Okay, moving on to getting into the the meat of this. it took me uh, 12 years to solve those two problems and one which I chose to work on, which was turning sociology into an actual real science because uh, when I went through the program... Uh, oh, it's garbage. Were, garbage. Yes, uh, uh, yeah, garbage in, garbage out. Just like out. psychology, it's, it's mainly you. mental yeah. ma- master- masturbation. Yeah. yeah, easy for me to say. Well, uh, it's like roadrunner.com. It's kind of hard. But listen, uh, the idea of sociology being a, a legitimate scientific pursuit uh, certainly was recognized by you, but was bypassed for a long time. I mean, this that is how they, they are controlling us through yes. sociological applications of technologies that most of us will never understand are being deployed to subjugate us. Yeah, one of the things that I discovered uh, was that I was violating one of two taboos. Uh, You weren't supposed to look too closely at intelligence operations, and the other area you were supposed to keep your nose out of um, had to do with... um, uh, you know, how the control mechanisms work, cognitive police functions, mm-hmm. which is, the, you know, what's behind all of the uh, programming on TV, you know, teaching you to avoid certain subjects, keeping you distracted. And one of the most important things they do is destroy your ability and the ability of our kids through the dumbing down process, uh, inhibit their ability to construct uh, reality simulations 
that are accurate.